I want to talk to you about a really interesting book in the Bible today. It is the book of Esther. You know, the book of Esther is a story you just can't make up. If you haven't read it, you should read it. I exhort you, I implore you, I encourage you to read the Old Testament book of Esther. It's Shakespearean in its power and in its significance. Of course, it's much greater than Shakespeare. It's an inspired word from God, but it has protagonists and antagonists. It has an incredible turn of plot. It has a very high moral themes that it pursues. Amazingly, in the book of Esther, seeing that it is a book of the Bible, it is a book in which the name of God is never mentioned. God's name is not mentioned once in the book of Esther. However, the hand of God, the providence of God, is clearly seen. The book of Esther was written in order to explain to the Jewish people why they were um, celebrating a feast called Purim. Apparently, they had begun to celebrate it as a people, and they didn't quite understand the history behind it, and so this was put down in the form of the book of Esther so that they would understand what the Feast of Purim was and why they celebrated it. It's really quite an amazing historical story. It happens in the reign of a king who in the scripture is called Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus or Ahasuerus is the way it's uh, uh, written and spoken in English actually is the king that we know or have come to know through historians as King Xerxes, one of the greatest kings ever to live. He ruled an um, empire of 127 provinces that stretched all, it was the Persian Empire at the time, 480 before Christ, stretched all the way from India all the way to Ethiopia. Very powerful king with sovereignty over all of these nations, and he had officials in all of these nations. He uh, is mentioned, he's known to us in the historian Herodotus, Herodotus, in his book called The Histories, uh, describes the conflict between the Persian Empire and the Greek Empire. He's a well-known, real figure in history. And this is information from the scriptures about things, important things that happened in his life and how he had an encounter with the living God, even though it was not by name, but it was through his providence. As I said, uh, Xerxes was very wealthy and he sponsored perhaps what we might call the first World's Fair. It was a 180 day event and he displayed all of his riches and all of his artwork and all of his tapestries and he encouraged people all throughout his empire to celebrate and to come to the capital, which at the time was Susa. That is, uh, that his empire, the base of his empire is now in what is modern day Iran and parts of modern day Iraq. And that's where the Persian empire is. It's in uh, what is now modern day Iran, where its seat is, where its center is. And this was in a time when there was a transition of power at this time. And so King, uh, King Ahasuerus, Xerxes, at the end of this feast, wanted to bring in his wife Vashti to display her beauty, as it is said, to all of the people who are at the World's Fair, who are at the gathering as it's ending. And she refuses to cooperate, and it creates a tremendous conflict between Xerxes and Vashti, and he divorces her, and then there's a contest to find the most lovely woman in the empire, and just by chance, a Jewish woman, and I use chance in quotes, everything in this book happens by chance, but everything happens on purpose. You see, it's not by chance, it's on purpose, but from our perspective, is by chance. So just by chance, Esther is identified as the one who's most pleasing to King Ahasuerus, Xerxes, and he takes her and crowns her as his queen in place of Vashti. And now she has a guardian, really her foster father, her adoptive father, whose name is Mordecai. 
Mordecai has brought her up in the Jewish heritage. He's very aware of the fact that he is a child, a physical child, a descendant of Abraham. They're part of the exile that has gone from Jerusalem and Judea to Babylon and now in Persia. And so they are essentially strangers in a strange land. They are uh, a foreign race among the Persians. And there are many of them there because many were, were brought out by Nebuchadnezzar a hundred years earlier. And their remnants are still living there. Some went back to Judea. We read about them in the book of Haggai, in the book of Ezra, in the book of Nehemiah. Many of them went back to Judah, and there was a significant kingdom of Judah that had been established by this time, and that was being established, a significant population. And all of the Jewish people are going to be affected by the events of this book. Now, Mordecai has adopted Esther when she became an orphan. She's raised in his home. And they are devoted to the Jewish faith and the Jewish practices and serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they are very aware that they have a special heritage. Now, Mordecai has achieved some kind of middle-level significance in the kingdom of uh, Xerxes. He's not a known official, but... He has access to the gate, the city gate, which is the place where judgment takes place. And he becomes aware of a plot to kill uh, Ahasuerus, to kill Xerxes. And he makes that known to the leaders of the people of Xerxes, of his security detail. And they identify these people, they are tried, and they are executed for treason. Meanwhile, a man named Haman, who's called an Agagite, which is related to the Amalekites, who traditionally have been enemies of the Jews in Judea, is raised to a position of great power. There is ethnic animosity between Haman, a very powerful king, a very powerful ruler in the Persian Empire under Xerxes, there is ethnic animosity between Haman and between Mordecai, who does not, by Haman's view, give sufficient honor to his position and to his place. And this so enrages Haman that he wants to institute something that has happened throughout history many, many, many times over. He wants to establish what we would call today a pogrom, that is a persecution, an effort to exterminate the Jewish people. Because of his animosity toward Mordecai, whom he knows is, is a descendant of Abraham, one of the exiled Jews, and because he knows that he is part of a much larger people, he wants not only to address the issue of Mordecai's insubordination, he wants to address the issue of the entire race, and he wants to eliminate them. And being the second most powerful person in the kingdom, he begins to initiate a plan to do that. It's diabolical. It is diabolical. It's spiritually empowered. It is demonic. Its purpose is to identify every Jew all throughout the empire and to allow the people to attack them and to take their property some of that property would be put into the king's treasury, the rest they could keep. And the idea was to completely to eliminate the race. I'm telling you this story really fast. But you have to know this to get where we're getting in this. You know, there have been pogroms of the Jews, that is, persecutions, attempts to exterminate the Jews throughout history. The first thing you see is, is in Egypt. There's an effort to destroy all of the firstborn, or all of the children, the male children. You see one here in the book of Esther. We see it in history, in various places. You see Herod trying to destroy the babies in a certain area of Judea. You see it in many times throughout history. During the times of the Crusades, there were crusades simply against the Jews, to eliminate them, and certainly we have seen that in the last century in the Third Reich's effort to exterminate 
the Jewish people. This is something that happens over and over and over again in history. This is one of the earliest demonstrations of it. And it is happening here in the reign of Xerxes under the agency of a man called Haman. So we see this over and over again. Now what we are going to see in this story in the next few minutes is that God's providence and God's sovereignty intervene to prevent that happening. What is God's providence? God's providence is that preservation, care, and governance which God exercises over all things that he's created. It's his ability to foresee and to guard his creatures. It's a manifestation of his divine care and protection. That's a simple dictionary definition. A summary of providence is it is the divine intervention in the affairs of man within the confines of natural law to bring about God's objective. What do I mean by that? Providence appears to be natural, using natural means. It doesn't appear to be miraculous. It appears that God's using everyday things to accomplish his purpose. Sovereignty is like providence. Providence and sovereignty overlap each other in the definition. Sovereignty is the means by which God causes all things to work together according to his will and his purpose. It's his ability to control events and purposes, his ability to raise up or to put down, to control the destiny of nations and individuals. These things are very much alike, but providence has to do with his individual care, specific care within the creation. What we're going to see is God's providence delivers the people of Judea. Now, why is that good news? The good news is that that same providence that protects the Jewish people from being eliminated in the book of Esther, and I urge you to read the book, it is a great read. The same care that delivers God's people, same care that delivers Esther and the people of the Jews is at work in your life as well. God's providence is in the work in all creation. Psalm 145, 16 says to the Lord, you open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Has anybody been blessed? Has anybody been filled? If anybody's been cared for, if anyone's been provided for, believer or unbeliever, God has been the provider of those things. He causes his rain to fall on the just and the unjust, his sun to, sun to shine on the just and the unjust. He provides all things for all people. That's his providence and his sovereign care over creation. It is continual and is recognized in Scripture. What we are called by the passage that we look at today, and I want to say that it's important for us at a time such as this that we live in, it is important for us to recognize and actively embrace the providence of God, to recognize and actively embrace, to confidently trust in God's providence. Now what we're gonna see is there's two aspects to providence. When we say if God's in control, God's sovereign, God's providing, well, I don't have to do anything. I can just sit back and let him do his thing. I have no responsibility. That's not what we're going to learn in the book of Esther. It's what we talked about last week. God's sovereignty and man's responsibility have an interplay. We're not dealing with kismet, which is an Islamic concept of fate. It looks like fate, but it's not fate. It's providence. And there is a tying together of the unseen purposes of God being brought to pass and the human responsibility is part of the calculus that brings about God's purpose. You say, well, I don't understand that. I don't understand it either. But we live under God's sovereign authority and we are subject to his sovereignty. We are recipients of his providence but we are also active and responsible agents in the creative order and our sin 
or righteous acts play a role in God bringing about his purpose, and it plays a role in our own destiny. We are moral beings made in the image of God. We're players in this stage. It matters how we respond. So there's an active part to providence. There's also a passive part. Because there's also, there's this mystery where, Lord, it's out of my hands. I've done what I know to do. There is no more power within me to accomplish any purpose. You must act. And if you don't act, I have no solution. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. There's a passive trust. There's an active execution of responsibility, and we're going to see that in Esther's life. And I want to tell you that is an important lesson for the church in the day in which we live. It's an important lesson for you individually, and it's an important lesson for us, not only collectively as a church, but as a people, and in the land and in the day in which we live. So, we see now the story. I've tried to give you the foundation. We see the story has now come to Esther in the fourth chapter. It's the middle of the book. Mordecai has found out about this plot that Haman has planned to destroy all the Jews, not only in Susa, not only in Persia, but all the way throughout the empire, and that would include Judea as well. It's this massive plan. It's as big as the plan of the Third Reich to completely eliminate the Jewish people. It's the same spirit. It's that same spirit that's working. Destructive and voracious and demonic. And so Esther finds out about it and says, well, there's nothing I can do Mordecai said, hey, go and talk to the king about this. You're the queen. You're the second one in power. Or you're not the second one in power. You're close to the one who is in power. Haman was the second in power, but perhaps Esther could have influence. And she says, I, I can't go before the king of my own volition. If you come before the king in this kingdom and you've not been called... You could be executed. And only if you were extended the invitation to continue to come in will you be heard and will your life be saved. This is dangerous business you're asking me to engage in, to go and talk to the king unbidden. And she tells that to Mordecai, and he hasn't called on me for 30 days. We're in a little bit of a separation here. Thing, the romance has cooled off a little bit, Mordecai. Okay, I'm not sure I've got any clout here. And Esther got this report, I mean, Mordecai got this word back. And he said, when Esther, it says, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. Very interesting intersection. Mordecai says, I know God's sovereign purpose will be accomplished. But I know that there are consequences for how we fulfill our personal responsibility. That's what he's saying. And who knows, but you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. And by the way, Herodotus makes it very clear that Xerxes was a very impetuous, 
and potentially violent man. She knows what she's dealing with here. If I perish, I perish. And so Mordecai went away and carried out all Esther's instructions. Well, I have a few questions in this passage. Why does Mordecai say deliverance will surely arise for the Jews? I'll tell you why he says it. Because he is aware not only of God's providence and how it works, and that's what he's expressing confidence in, God will cause this to come about, but he also knows God's word and God's decrees. And he knows that God has decreed to Abraham, out of your seed shall come one to bless the nations, through whom the nations will be delivered. He knows that God has put his hand upon the people of God to protect them and to watch over them. He knows that there is a covenant between God and his people and that God is committed to protecting his people. He knows this through scripture. He knows this through the prophets. He knows this through the Old Testament. So he knows deliverance will arise. Then the question is, how does God bring deliverance? Quite interestingly, he brings it through providence. He brings it through, especially through timing. This book is about timing that is just phenomenal. It's so beautiful. Timing is the word kairos in, in, uh, in the Septuagint, the Hebrew Bible translated into Greek. We know this word. It's a word that means a ripe season, a time of opportunity. And Mordecai says to Esther, who knows but you have been brought to the kingdom for, except for a kairos in the Septuagint, the kairos such as this. This wasn't an accident, Esther, that you came into power. This wasn't an accident that you were chosen. This was God's predetermined plan, and we're recognizing it, and there's a purpose for you being where you are. And that puts a responsibility upon you. Nothing is an accident. Even when Esther goes into the king after the prayer and fasting and he receives her, he doesn't just blurt out, she doesn't just blurt out her request. She doesn't just say, Haman's got a horrible plan, would you please get rid of him? That's not how, because she's very uh, kind of seductive about how she does it. Oh, you want to know what I would like? Well, why don't you come to a feast that I've prepared tomorrow. Make it a little bit kind of, okay, what's going on here? So she puts it off a day, but that day is crucial to God's providence unfolding because on that day, Haman goes out from the king's presence. He goes home and he says, man, this is my lucky day. This is wonderful. I I'm going to have, uh, be, I am uh, just climbing up in the kingdom of the king. And I am going to uh, be at the banquet with Queen Esther. No one else has been invited. But one thing bugs me. It's this guy, Mordecai, who's constantly making uh, me angry with his disrespectful attitude. And his wife gives him some great advice. Hey, Make a gallows, and then after the feast tomorrow, you can hang him. You're the second most powerful person in the kingdom. And he says, great idea. So he has it made. And meanwhile, the king can't sleep. That one night delay just so happens that he can't sleep. Just so happens by accident that he calls for the annals. As someone said, a nice boring book that could be read to him so he could go to sleep. And they're reading this nice, boring book to him. And in the boring book, it says, at one point in time, Mordecai turned into the KGB, some folks that were plotting against you, king. And uh, the king said, hey, we ever done anything for that guy? 
And they say, no, nothing's been done. He says, okay, we'll take care of it. And so the next day, the, the king says, okay, who's in the outer court? And just so happens, by accident, that Haman walks into the court. And the king asks Haman, what should be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? And Haman says, well, who would the king want to honor but me? And he gives him this great, I guess his own fantasy of being led through the city on the king's horse with a crown, with a robe that belonged to the king and being exalted. And that's what he wanted. Unfortunately, it wasn't given to Haman. It was given to Mordecai, and there was this complete reversal of fortunes. And that began the downfall of Haman. And those of you who know the story know what happened. Haman was, was uh, just a, a ashamed. He was flummoxed as he led Mor uh, Mordecai through the city. Things had turned upside down so quickly, all because of timing all because of the time that the king couldn't sleep, all because of the book and where they happened to read, all because Haman happened to be the one who was in the court who was being brought in, all because of providence. We know none of this is an accident, and Haman himself believes in providence. You see, there's a counterfeit providence in this book. Purim, it's a Persian word. Purim is a kind of casting lots. What they did was, Haman, when he was deciding when to initiate this battle against the Jews throughout the empire, he cast lots. It was an occult form of divination to determine when the gods would say, or the spirits would say, and we know what spirit it is, would say, what's the most propitious day for us to do this? And so he's calling upon demonic power to give him guidance because he knows timing is important. Everybody knows timing is important. Everybody understands there's a concept of, they call it fate, or they call it chance, but we know it's providence. It's something else. God is in control. And God is working. You ever had an experience of providence? I had an amazing experience of providence. Uh, I'm sure I have them all the time. We all have them all the time. But I had one that was just visible. I've told you this before, but I'm going to tell you again. It's many years ago when I was being discipled and was preparing to go into ministry, I worked for uh, an Amoco oil distributor, which you can't find anymore, by the way. I think BP bought them. I worked for an Amoco oil distributor, and I uh, would drive uh, their truck. And I think Steve Ingram remembers that, and I would come into meetings smelling like gasoline. Uh, quite often, I would drive their oil and gas truck up throughout Albemarle County and Greene County and beyond, and one day, I was up in Greene County, and when I was up there in Greene County, I was given directions to drop some oil at a house with pink shutters. That was my address. And so, as it got dark, I couldn't discern the pink shutters. I said, you know what, I'm gonna have to call it a day. So I pulled into a driveway, which I really shouldn't have done with that big oil truck, but I did just to turn around, and the guy pulled in behind me. I said, oh no, he's gonna be really upset with me. And this is up in Greene County. Uh, I don't know anybody up there, I don't think. Out of the car gets a fella who was a member of our church in Charlottesville. And I said, what are you doing here, Rodney? He says, this is where my mom and dad live, and they also went to the church. And I said, really? He said, yeah, come on in. We're going to have dinner. I said, great. <laughs> so I went in and had dinner. And he said, by the way, tonight's our home group. Everybody showed up right after dinner. I'm just sitting there. I mean, God just plopped me right down there. I mean, I could have turned around in 100 driveways. That was the one I turned around. I could have been any time, but it was right when Rodney was turning in. 
I could have been Thursday night when they didn't have a meal, when they didn't have a hunger, but there it was. That's what's going on with Esther here. But it wasn't just that. I was going to have to return to Charlottesville with product, and I didn't want to do that. So at the end, at the very end of the home group, there's a knock on the door. It says, hey, I saw the truck. Are, are you coming to the house with the pink shutters? I said, yeah. He says, that's me. Come on. <clears throat> that was great. It was, like, it was just like God just opening the curtain. You think, you think I can't handle this? You think I can't handle this? Yeah, that was, that was, I was just like, it was just, that's what it was. It's beautiful. So, we see just a few things here. Sovereignty and personal responsibility. Esther is to actively embrace God's providence and also constant, confidently trust in it. It says that Esther is called to ponder God's provision, to recognize it. Mordecai helps her, her father, her adoptive father, he says, how do you know if you've not come to the kingdom for such a time as this? He says, this is God's providence. Don't mistake what's happening here. God has put you where you are. So she's called to ponder it, to recognize. Secondly, she's called to embrace God's provision. What do I mean by that? You must recognize God's put here, and you cannot be silent. You must embrace it. You must exercise personal responsibility on what you've been given if you were to expect for it to result actually in a blessing for you. If you keep silent, you know, there's a saying that's going around today, silence is violence. It is sometimes used well, sometimes used not very well. There are those who force you to say things that you don't believe or agree in. But there is truth in the reality that silence is violence. So for her to be silent would be violence against the Jews and she would not escape. We're often silent when we can give a word of help. We're often failing to act when we can bless, when God has providentially put good things in our hands. And we say, well, I'm not responsible. And so we withhold. You know, there's two kinds of sins. Most of us think about sins of commission. Well, I won't do that, and I won't do that, and I won't do that, and that's a problem. You won't do that because they're sins of omission, things that you won't do, Things that you don't do because you shouldn't do and things that you don't do that you should do. That is actually where much of our sin lies. And we never see it that way. It's just something in our makeup. But what he's saying is if you are silent, you will be sinning against God's providence. We see that in Scripture. Open your mouth for the mute. For the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge, righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Also in Proverbs, rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, behold, we did not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? This is the dilemma that Esther is in. She knows, she sees, and it'd be really easy to say nothing, but Mordecai says, no, you have a responsibility here. Some of you are familiar with that beautiful, beautiful novel, uh, musical, play, movie, Les Miserables. In that novel, written by Victor Hugo, Hugo, John Valjean, who has escaped and has a new identity. It's a beautiful picture of law and grace, by the way. Sees a man being arrested on the pretense that it's him. And the song is beautiful. He says, you know... 
I can just let it go. And then I'm free forever. So I can't do that. My conscience, made in the image of God, my soul, which has received the grace of God, the providence of God, will forever live under a shadow. If I let that happen. Could Esther have gotten away with it? I don't know. Mordecai says, no, you will not escape. Esther is called to fight for sacrifice for God's provision. In other words, there's action that has to be taken. She has to act. Fast for me. Pray with me. Move the spiritual forces. This is a demonic battle that only fasting and prayer can overcome. And only corporate fasting and prayer can overcome. That's why we had a corporate day of returning yesterday. This is a big, huge spiritual battle that wants to wipe out an entire race. Pray for me. And then I will act and I will be vocal. And if I perish, I perish because she's not only called to fight and to sacrifice but she's also called actively to trust God's provision. If God doesn't protect me, I will not survive. And you know what? As Christians, we actually have to have that attitude. We have to take up our cross. Well, we might get in trouble. This, what? Yeah, it might cost. And it costs people all over the world to be faithful, to recognize and to act on the providence of of God and the provision that God has made. Well, I owe to Tony Evans these last few thoughts, who has done a tremendous series on the book of Esther, which I didn't get to see except a very small portion of it. And this, the next chapter he reviews, and Esther's faithfulness to talk to the king and his command and decree to remove Haman from power and to give everything that was Haman's to Mordecai and to reverse the decree to destroy the Jews is just a picture of reversal. It's Shakespearean in its beauty and power. There's an economic reversal, said Evans. The house of Haman is given to Mordecai, everything in it. There is a political reversal. Haman is put, uh, Mordecai is put in Haman's place and given the signet ring. There's a legal reversal. The Jews, there's a law made now that the Jews can defend themselves against their attackers. There's an emotional reversal because there is joy among the Jews instead of the incredible consternation and fear that was there. And there is a spiritual reversal, according to Evans, and it's all a beautiful interpretation of the book, application. Because many of the Gentiles now want to become Jews. Everything's upside down. Everything is turned upside down by the providence of God and by the faithful pursuit, faithful execution of responsibility under the sovereignty of God. So, what do we do? We need to understand God's providence works through means. Pleasant and unpleasant, planned and unplanned. You know, that car that was stolen... That's, that's, imp- that's really unpleasant. Really unpleasant. I trust God will show you some grace in the midst of that. All of us have experienced things. Often beyond our control and usually without our consent, God's providence is at work. We must recognize God's promises from Scripture that steals us when providence seems hidden or difficult. We need to recognize God is at work when we are not. Mark 4 says the seed of the kingdom is growing little by little. Night and day, unknown. We need to recognize that God has a final say. No man, no circumstance, no enemy, no evil, no wickedness. Some of you are in a hard place even now. You have to recognize that God moves 
in mysterious ways. That beautiful William Cowper hymn, hymn puts it so well. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. You must embrace his ultimate provision for you, which is the person of Jesus Christ. He made a provision for you before you knew you needed one, before you were born. He made a provision for you when you were living in sin and wandering from him. He made a provision for you to save you and to help you and to heal you. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is God's ultimate provision for every one of us. And when we embrace Christ's sacrifice for us, our eyes are open to see his providence. And our eyes and hearts are open to hear his voice. And our conscience is awakened by the Holy Spirit to fulfill our responsibility to use what he's given us for his kingdom and his purposes. Let's stand and pray and let us worship together. Father, we thank you for your providence that we see in the book of Esther. We thank you, Lord, that we must embrace your provision. Even when everything looks dark, you're still there. We're thankful, Lord, that you can turn everything upside down in a moment. That is the lesson of Esther. Even though your name is not mentioned, your hand is clearly seen. Father, it is our prayer that we may actively embrace and confidently trust in your provision at all times. In your name we pray, amen.